Uh, so here's what a pivot is. So one thing, has anyone seen this top, exactly this top before? It's the top of the room? Okay, cool. So uh, let's go ahead. You know what? Uh, I'm really curious about the difference between your audiences. Who here uses Gigi Plot Tree? Most people. Who here has used the Pyre? Great. Who here has used Tiger? Awesome. Who here is, uh, has used Groom Okay, so this is one of our best parts. It's the audience side. Uh, so, I think about Groom. It's not a package I've been, uh, I've been, uh, have been working on about the last two years, taking statistical models and turning them into tidy data frames. So, what is tidy data? Even people that have worked with tools like GDPot2 and DeepPlyer that rely on these might uh, maybe not be familiar with, with the, uh, the actual definition of the term. There's a file that I have to work on in 2014 in uh, JSS paper as the data frames arrange from one row for each observation, a separate column for each variable, and a table for each type of observational unit. If you've worked with GDPot2, you probably find that you're getting a you will naturally structure your data in this way, so say every row ends up as one um, point on your or, uh, or particular point in your uh, result of the plot without necessarily even realizing uh, the definition. But it has a particular uh, it has a particular definition for this kind of data. And once you can, once you work, once you structure your data in this way, you get to use these great tools. Tidier, you get tidy data to spread rows out in columns, or rather, uh, in, co uh, in columns in the rows, so that you can bring your data into a tidy form. The plier allows you to, uh, to sub select your variables, to filter your observations, or group by and then summarize your observations with uh, ways of manipulating tidy data. And she plot choose a way of visualizing your tidy data using the grammar of graphics. So uh, other than we use not only the tidyverse tool is pretty much what we have with them, but also data.evil is a tool that, that goes back even farther and also relies on similar principles. And even now outside of R, you've got a package of pandas in Python that has similar structures. It's a really powerful way of working with your data. And unless you kind of flow through your data in order like this, you start with your messy data, you bring it in whatever format you have. So take a tool like Tidier and turn it into tidy data, organize it the way you want it to be organized. We'll take a tool like the Plier and manipulate it. We'll take it and, uh, and do summaries, do filtering, select the variables you want. And after you've done your manipulations and your summarizing, you can uh, you'll visualize it with ggplot too. This is kind of a tidier framework for exploratory data analysis. And all of that works really well until you start doing statistical modeling. As soon as you start doing the uh, statistical modeling, you've got objects that can no longer use uh, the prior for model manipulation. You have, to, you have to use a different set of tools. You can't use DigiPlot 2 for model visualization. And the reason you can't do these things is that model objects aren't tidy, they're messy. So what do I mean by a model object being messy? Consider the linear regression, kind of a canonical example of an R, a built-in R statistical model. Take, take, let's say we take the, uh, the built-in empty cars that I set, and all we do is perform uh, a linear regression uh, predicting fuel efficiency by the car's weight and acceleration. A simple linear model. Raise your hand if you've seen a summary output of a linear model like this before. If only on like roughly our first class or whatever. So we would boil on these work in data like this. So what is messy about it? Consider the, this set of coefficients, this matrix of coefficients, with our uh, estimated slopes, uh, the, uh, the intercept, and our uh, uh, t statistics and p values. The first problem is the easiest to get at this matrix, uh, then you would then it takes three steps. We do a summary on the linear model, we have to grab the coefficients out, and then it's a matrix to turn into a data frame. So as soon as you want to work with this data frame, you've already got three functions to call. Once you've done that, you have another problem. You have information stored in your row names. So the, uh, the uh, intercept, the term that we're particularly working with here is, uh, is not a column, it's in row names, which means you can't combine multiple models. R doesn't like duplicated row names in a data frame. 
Once you've gotten past those issues, you run it column and uh, the columns are incomplete. They have uh, spaces in them, they have punctuation in them, and they're between different types of models and different, different, uh, different practices. So, for example, once you turn this into a data frame, all the punctuation and spaces will get replaced with periods. Another problem you run into, uh, this is a weird one, is so the information secured in your print method. This is the key value for the uh, app test on the entire regression. This value is not stored in the linear model. It is only computed when you print this. So that means you have multiple models who want to compare their app statistic. You have to go through the process of computing it again. So if you're, if you're um, an experienced model, you'll be able to solve each of these. But all together, they add up to a massive inconvenience when you want to work with your model objects. And the, uh, the reason we came up with Broom is that we as they kind of realized that these problems aren't the exception to the rule. Every model object you run into, you're going to find a case where it takes many steps to extract data with uh, data with information in row names, uh, inconvenient column names, data that's computerly printed. This is always happening to you when you work with models. So Broom had a graph package gives you methods to do the work for you. Here we see the tidy method from Groove from the form of a linear uh, model gets to a data frame with uh, where it's just one step, not multiple, where the column names are uh, uh, convenient, those can be lowercase, not have spaces of punctuation, and the information will always be stored in columns, not row names, which makes it convenient to recombine. So that's what the, what the Groove package does. Is so think of tidy your model objects, turn them into tidy data frames that can be used with the tidy tools like e pi r, uh, pi r, and g plot So that's how we'll fit into our general structure. We will use our tidy methods not only before we've done modeling, but after as well. We have to be tidy model tidy. We can manipulate our models with e pi r and visualize them with g plot before we go any further, any questions about the top ones? How do you put in your model? Great. So I've shown the tidy method. The room actually defines three methods for extracting the pieces from an object. This is in line with the tidy philosophy, where each type of observational unit needs to get its own cleavage. And out of each model, we can get multiple times types of statistics. So the tidy method, that's what we call component level statistics, and that's the coefficients we've been looking at. These are statistical conclusions of your model. We know coefficients are p values. We've also got observation level statistics, which is predicted values and residuals, coming out with the augment method that augments your original data with, with those additions. We've also got the model level, where you get a single statistic for a model, such as an R squared, adjusted R squared, F statistic, where you get one single obvious information from an entire model. You've already seen the tidy step, where you tidy on the new model, get one row per coefficient. You do augment on the same object, what you get instead is one row for each original observation. Here we see observation, observation, observation. We see original data with no names moved in. Miles per gallon, weight to set the acceleration. And then additional columns, your fitted values, uh, your, uh, so you your, 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 your um, standard error prediction, your residuals. Uh, so yeah, these are uh, additional values. And each of the new columns will start with a dot invented from a uh, conflicting with your original data. So these are ways of augmenting your original data with predictions and residuals. The glance method will all on one model will always return one row, a single row with statistics per model statistics. We might not see how this is useful consider when you start working with multiple models, you're able to combine them together and compare these model summary statistics. Here, R squared, adjusted R squared, the sigma for the residuals, you've got your um, F system P value, AIC, DIC, deviance, one row from the entire model. So tidy, augment, and glance 
which are collected at different levels of our model. Any questions about highly automated glass? Can you just go back to the table? I just want to look at that. This area is your, is your original empty cars data, the part of it. And these are additional values. You actually have predictions and residuals combined with the original data. Yeah, yeah, what happens if your model has, uh, for the residuals, it has like a residual for the model and residual for the response? Do you have your choice? Uh, it's a great question. Augment has a uh, method, uh, wait, 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 so, um, let's say a GLM. Yeah, LN five years. Yes, what you have is this type dot residuals argument. It will determine if you do your response or if you do your um. What the other one? I forget what it's called. Yeah, the only one I ever look at is the response. Yes, exactly. Um, and then you can decide safely for if you if you want to get a new data. Just another thing. I didn't go over here, but you can also give off new data that can be very useful. Uh, you know, and then finding predictions on your data. Uh, yes, uh, that's a yeah. good question. So we're going with linear models a lot, but there's a lot of types of models with the same philosophy of class. Consider non-linear at least squares. So in this case, let's say we don't have a linear relationship. Uh, we don't see a linear relationship uh, of any other parts that uh, we might try to predict miles per gallon by weight, and we want to predict an exponential relationship. Who here has used NLS to pick non nearly squares? That place uh, is a common right here, but this is um, it's going to be a different type of object. But if I do a summary on this non nearly squares object, which does um, uh, in uh, on their optimization, uh, we'll get out some similar parameters, residuals, and other things, and highly augmenting glands will work very similarly. Heidi will get out the parameters that were estimated uh, from your non nearly squares model. Augment will add predictions and residuals to the original data. And glance again, we'll show you that you're um, we'll do a one row data frame for your entire model. So even though besides the linear regression, we also have uh, also other kind of regression and prediction uh, models. But it's not just prediction and regression methods where this kind of approach with high augment and glance makes sense. Consider k means. Here we're forming k. Uh, who is using k means in R? Impossible. So the um, so if you do k means, you get an output that looks like this. You have some cluster data with your with your um, actually your dimensions into your cluster means. You have a vector showing where you cluster each of your original points. You have some kind of model statistics and highly and uh, group and collect each of those out as a tidy data. So here, if you perform tidy just on the uh, if you perform tidy just on the means object, you get one row per original cluster. So it's three rows of your cluster, uh, cluster three groups. Augment will, to, will uh, assign each of your um, each of your rows to your cluster and add a dot cluster argument. So predictions work even if you're not talking about something like a linear or a linear squared fit. We are adding columns to your original data. And glass will give you values of the total sum of squares and total within sum of squares to describe the entire operation of your current model of statistics. There's a lot of objects. I think right now we're somewhere between 70 and 80 uh, objects we get from both built in and many uh, additional packages that uh, bring Canada and Heidi. If you go to your, this is by Aaron, yours is Heidi, you can go to. Uh, Here on the um, on the GitHub Brewing page, we've got a, we've got an automated list that compiles um, a table every single uh, with every class that we has a tidy way to find for. Some model have all tidy up and glance just by their um, by the nature of the model, but it really covers a large uh, variety of things we could want we could want we could want to model your data. Any questions about how many of these does this work for classification models as well as which classification model? Well, I just went right before 
purposes in the way. Generally, generally, absolutely. Mountain cars is on the issue of this. I have uh, like the art part package. Um, art part is mountain cars, right? It's not yeah, yeah. 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 This is not the ideal way to, to do it. But the, um, yeah, the, the art part is not current, is not implemented yet. Uh, right now, it's like, um, I want to incorporate the rate of added features to model. We are adding our models to bring. Uh, we have, um, there are a few classifiers. The classification is like super fan work, so I uh, can't say it off the top of my head, but uh, yes, it absolutely can be covered and, uh, and will be mentioned. Pull requests are definitely welcome as well. So, yeah. Yeah, so you have some spatial objects here that also include like uh, your spatial version of, but where you kind of like a uh, like auto correlation model in, like uh, your plans and uh, the global and local output. That's a good question. I'm not sure about uh, spatial polygon data frames, but I'm not sure about what kind of what class would that be, you know? What package? Okay. Um, the SDF package provided by the spatial inference package. Yeah, I'm not sure if we have the model output, but. Uh, but if we don't have, if we try and we don't have, please open an uh, open and uh, get a picture. Uh, we better get full of classes working on expanding out of these. I'll show a couple of examples in a, uh, in, in a second um, of a few of these models uh, so you'll uh, see a little more of them. Just any questions about anything? Yeah. What is the, uh, I, I don't do much stats anymore, so <laughs> I don't uh, use, use it too much, but. Is it hard to? I assume like all the the packet the, the stat the methods that are in packages are in suggests. So yes. Instead of you suggest what's Yep. If you look at Fran package room, it suggests a lot of packages. Oh. And we're working on I'm considering ways of bringing this down. Uh, some of the ideas include when we can. Um, this one I'm I'm sorry to talk some about is see if we can get packages to implement the uh, tiny dot of plants in there. Their own packages. I think in a real world, as many of these, of these um, uh, methods would live in their own packages, so the authors have control over them. Uh, but in the meantime, so they could have asked, I'm happy to, to implement them in Vroom, uh, but that would, that would certainly help. Another is breaking off a few in, uh, in other packages. Uh, anyone here in work in computational biology or genomics? Anyone here know where you use bioconductor? No, so the um, bioconductor is a whole class of uh, packages for computational biology, and all polygonic plants that we them live in bioproom on bioconductor. That's one way we split it up. So, yeah. So the uh, another is uh, is is uh, methods for text mining, including from uh, TM, from Quantia, and uh, probably any others that are going to develop uh, oh, and on the top of models package. Uh, or live in a tiny text package that uh, Julia Sylvie and I developed. Oh. So there's ways that we're splitting out some of this. Uh, some of this um, so that's all in tiny text? The, the text might be one's up, yeah. Yeah, great. So why are tiny models useful? Here's where we get to the, uh, a bit of demo. And one of the main reasons is that once you tie your model, you can start visualizing it. It's true because of the GDP, because GDPlot 2 lets you work so many parameter graphics where you're trying to take your tidy data and to find connections between the tidy data and visual, uh, and visual representation. So I'll show an example. Who here is the survival package for the survival analysis? A couple of people. So the, um, take a look at this, uh, this one data set where you've got a uh, survival package. Let's kind of the text a little bigger. We've got this called uh, serve bits that predict a survival curve based on, say, a um, cost proportional hazard model. What I'm doing here is a, uh, what we've got here is a lung cancer data set called lung. We've got, uh, to, we've got at each time who has already, uh, who each time has died of lung cancer of this data set for particular ages. Um, of the figure of age sets uh, at particular time points. The uh, survival package can take this and predict uh, amounts of, uh, the amount of time of survival based on age and sex, and you can fit what's called a predicting path of my from that. And that looks like you use the built in one, and you just and you take a serve fit object. 
objects. Take is just this built-in serve fit object. Uh, let's say you really know how to work with this on us you know how to work with this in your summary of serve fit. Grab what I can out. I still got some of the punctuation and all those other issues. But the um, if I run Pi on it, what I get out is a uh, I think uh, Pi on serve fit is the first three rows. What I get out is Pi that point, which shows at each time point what I predict the percentage of people that will survive to that point. So the um, built in plotting output of plot serve fit, look, plot serve fit looks like this. This shows over time, number of days, uh, the uh, percentage of people that will survive to a particular point at, with a uh, prediction interval of a 9 percent prediction interval. I don't like using base plotting, and I really don't like plots like this where you can't customize or work with them. So I really don't like these these uh, plots. Instead, if we type, let's take this and say, let's take our type out, and now that it's typing, we can start working with Gigi's plot here. So if you take this, say with pi on the x-axis, <coughs> s pin on the y-axis, start with I want a line plot. Already I've got percentage of people that will survive a particular time point seem to decrease over time. I really want a, a confidence interval ribbon here though. So I add, that's the top flowing of top high command, where it can actually say geom error bar AES is going y min equals top flat low, y max equals top flat high. That's because of you, that's what uh, this shows here with our top high and top low columns. So, something else you might have to do with this. Here uh, you pop, pop, geom error bar. Looks like this. I can instead do geom ribbon and throw in a little bit of alpha, alpha 0.5. Now that our confidence interval, and it's much more customized than the IMG plot too. For example, let's the y-axis should really be a uh, percent. Scales. There we go, what percentage people survive over time? Predicted survival. And then you plot two and start working with this, with this way. So this is something you couldn't have done with the original data. And some models to small step and some model to large step to get a ready for GG plot two. Another example I won't show you uh, here is we took our linear model to that we could have done a coefficient plot ready for mm -hmm. using with this geom error bar H idea. Uh, meaning we have to hide in our element. So that would have taken a couple of steps to, uh, uh, if you wanted to do it straight from our linear model object. Show survival. One another one I won't show is we take out where is our last little regression with the GLM net calculation. So you want to show the change in mean squared error when you are uh, alter lambda, you can pull that right out of the tidy down version of the CPG on method, and you see this shape where when Lambda is, uh, is too high, and no correct parameters that it's got some square the ideal penalty parameter, and then uh, going back up to that off, it's in the way you geo in it into GGPlot 2 once you tie in the output. Any question about visualizing these models? Like our survival model or something else? So I'm definitely a bigger fan of uh, I'm a fan of two plus two over these, but um, we're really stuck over base one, but I prefer base one uh, uh, that's why I should do because the way that how it really kicks in is when you start working with multiple models. So this is something that's a kind of a, it's, it's a newer kind of philosophy. You have to go through this working a lot on, on this topic. And because it, when you once you make a model tidy, you can start combining it, stacking it, kind of like once, uh, once they're everyone's in the same shape, you can start stacking them like they are a kind of a ship where they all have the same format into a single data frame. So for example, here you've got our, our data frame earlier, but once you now fix it into the data frame, you combine that. 
Every one of these models might represent different parameters to your model your machine learning output, represent different methods that you're combining. It could be bootstrap methods, and I'll show an example of that in a second. It could be with each subgroup that something else is going to, uh, to look at. Or they could, let's say, be a machine learning ensemble voting method, where every model has a different kind of voting kind of you want to then summarize the outputs. So working with models in a list, it's difficult to do those summaries. But once they're each kind of stacked together, if you, uh, you start using these tools that can apply our GPOP to, to work with these models together. So when you have a model that's called, you start thinking about how uh, you might have another another call that shows the um, the choose of say parameter for each of these, or maybe multiple uh, parameters that are defining each of these calls. So here you can see like nested particular uh, parameters, each describing model, and I can start manipulating these. So here I'm going to show a few examples of combining and comparing multiple models. This question, who here has used the nest and or unnest functions in Pyre? These are a lot newer than some of the other ones, so this is sort of an introduction to them as well. They're very powerful from Pyre for this. Who here has used the pure, pure package for functional programming now? So you got it. really good at this higher before, probably mostly been using on um, like spread and gather, and this is a bit newer. And pure is, is a lot newer than that. Uh, so this is sort of the touch both that in combination with room. So let's start with subgroup models. Who is familiar with the orange data set in uh in uh, built into R? These are orange trees. One, we have one, two, three, four, five orange trees, and it shows their age, I think it's in days, and the circumference, I think it's in uh, centimeters. Days, millimeters. Okay, that makes the most sense for an orange tree. All right, so we've got this uh, relationship of one, two, three, four, five trees, their age, and their circumference. So let's, so there's our orange cat. If I wanted to, I could do a linear model. Which I could, what would I predict as the uh, y axis? What would I, what would I want to do a linear model to relate age to circumference, per circumference, which might probably be used as the predictor and which is the uh, rest of it? Predict circumference based on age. Predict circumference based on age. Yeah. So anyone, uh, here's the same thing circumference explained by age. Data equals orange. Now I've got my linear model. We've all seen that, and no surprise. Uh, for, so, quick question for every day, how many millimeters is the average tree growing? One. What? One. One. Okay. So, I can take this, I could just tidy this. That can be a little useful, I want a coefficient plot. What's really powerful is when we start doing nested models. What if we want to say, bit of linear regression for each tree, so we can find out for each tree how fast it's growing. The idea of that, start by visualizing it for a second. Take that orange tree, age, circumference, you know, point. This is the relationship to general for age circumference. Linear model is a good idea. Say color equals tree. Throw that in. And now we can start to see the relationship between our uh, age and circumference and how which, is, which tree is growing fastest. Uh, so, yes, which tree is growing fastest? I'm going to yell it out. Four. Four, exactly. The purple tree. Which tree looks like it's growing slowest? Three. 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 Awesome. Yes, yeah, so you can kind of see the other uh, it's a fact. It looks like they ordered those in that order for us in the data set. Uh, so let, let's, let's try that. Let's try a linear regression for each tree. You're going to do that. Let's say you're going to do that. If someone who hasn't been through yet, think about how you would do that. Uh, you, know, you might need to do a loop over each of them. If you are more experienced, you might uh, with things like uh, tools so might be had a prior, or you might uh, use um, down that table or group, or um, the players group by 
what you want to do is when you're thinking of model frames, you're going to have to hide that model frame in line. So I'm going to show the way most, um, the way right now that I tend to use nested models, uh, it's a combination of higher and curve. So let's look, let's look at our one more time. And this time, let's see the orange data set. Who are using the pipe day to day? Raise your hand. If you're not using the pipe, uh, if you're not uh, familiar with the pipe, this is the pipe takes the um, whatever it's currently uh, we're going to see this orange data, and then applies it to puts it in as the first argument to the next function. So the orange piped into the head function will flow is the same thing as head of orange. This ends up being uh, useful if you want to apply multiple functions in a row. I guess you know, I'm going to assume in general that we're just familiar with deep bio, if, uh, since I saw the uh, majority of people were. If you're not uh, trying to still um, see if you can follow along with the classes, even if maybe it's not the code you're most familiar with. Sig orange, I'm going to turn it, please deep fire, turn it into a table dip. That's just the, um, that's just like a table uh, where it trips a little bit uh, in a bit of a portrait way. I'm going to use a tidier function called nest. What nest does is we right now about have one row for every observation of a tree age and circumference. Instead, I want to get one row for every tree. And nest the rest in the data. The way to say that is to say nest negative tree. Minus tree, that means nest everything besides tree in the same column. So what this creates is a nested data where we have one row for tree one, one row for tree two, row for tree three, four, five, and then each of them has is a list column that contains the data from. List columns are kind of core of this, of this new way of thinking about multiple models. It's the fact that the data frame can contain a column within a list of the same length as the other columns, and in there you can stick an object of whatever complexity you want. So let's say I've done this. I say that this is my nested data frame. Here's my nested data frame. The data column that was created is now a list of data frames. First is this is the one for tree one, this is the one for tree two, tree three, four, five. So now we're going to get a nested data for each of them in a tree. Any questions about nested? I want you to have a good try saying nest only circumference. And then it would have done it, it would have tried to nest it based on how much the tree and age, so all the tree and ages have the same uh, relationship, so it's not as useful. But it could have said nest by tree and circumference, nest tree and circumference. And now for every day, day 118, I've got uh, You could do the same thing without apply. I end up liking um, map a little bit more for its uh, syntax, especially when you get some more complicated various models. And here it can say map to the data column. It's saying I want to apply to each item in the data column. I want to apply this. I want to say I want to do a linear model. The whole thing is a way of saying I want to perform this uh, on it and say I want circumference explained by age with data equals dot. So that purely and dot is how we define an action I want to do for each data frame. So, so map is saying apply to each of these data frames this linear regression. When I run that, I get a new list column. And now each item in the list column contains, in the mod for model list column, contains a linear model. Any questions? So we did one step to combine the data for each tree. Second step, Linear model for each of those sub data sets. Third step, these linear models can't do much with them. We can't say, uh, we can't arrange them by slope or anything that still stories these nested objects. So let's create a tidy version of the coefficients for each. So say coex equals, you can use map again on the data, uh, sorry, on the model column. 
I'm going to map the timing function to the room each time. And Python takes each of those and turns it into a into a data uh, frame of coefficients. So now we had a linear model, we had a first data set for each, we turned a linear model for each, we turned to a coefficients for each. If I just save this, I would look at here's our nested data. These are our five data sets. These in the nested dollar sign mod are our five models. And then in coefficients, here are our five tidy coefficients. Now that they're tidy by room, we can unnest. We combine them into one poly data. Unnest, and that's the function unnest uh, in a tidier, say, unnest coefficients column. Notice carefully what it did. There were, uh, um, I think I'll take a little bit of on nest data. There were four steps here. Nest, which we combine that with each subset. Uh, model, we, for every sub, for every data set, we form a linear regression. Tidy, where for every data set, um, every model, we turn it into its tiny coefficient vector. And then unnest, take those nested data frames and we combine them into a larger data frame. And now we have, here we have data we can actually work with as a tied data. These are the coefficients for our five linear models. At this point, we can do, we can work with them in, in a tidy, in a deep I can say, I don't care about that intercept terms. I'm going to filter only the cases where the term is age. I can do that because now we're in data frame. I want to visualize. I, I, one of the ways to well, let's say add comp is equal to true for that tidy step. Now I've got the, um, I've got for every one of these, um, any of these. Now I've got a comp is equal to full solution that I can make up coefficients, filter them, return equals age. Now I accept the H uh, terms, and I can say the plot that. Say I want the uh, uh, estimate by tree point, and I'll say here are my estimates of the uh, of the group of the slopes for each tree. I want to throw in some uh, error bars, genome error bar H. Comp flow, comp five. These are my terms for each of the five trees and their growth, uh, their growth rates. So from a growth rate in say millimeters per day of our five trees. And we can work with this because now we have stat tiny models. Yeah. Okay, so any questions about that? Yeah, any questions about tiny linear models? So if you're interested in this, uh, in this, I'll uh, show you a little bit there. Um, yeah, so this shows how we can do particular subsets. The room and deep pi r vignette that comes with that friend, here it is, room and deep pi r, uh, does share the same example. It does it a little bit differently because it's a vignette that it's going to change in a future version of room. This vignette was done before, um, uh, before, before uh, nest and unnest were developed. Uh, but yeah, but you can uh, we can read a bit more about working with uh, with uh, some models. And uh, the other thing you can do with the series it doesn't need to be just coefficients. It can be uh, it could also be uh, uh, let's change this to augment and look at our uh, observations. Like our now we we've um, take a look at our, now we've got. Here's our original data. We've also added predictions and residuals for a linear for each individual linear model. So by dividing it up, fitting a linear model, then augmenting it, we were able to um, uh, we can take these residuals. We can look actually at the residuals. And this lets us have, for example, heterostasticity within each model. 
So here I'd say, pick um, your observations, that's these. Pick your observations, plot uh, time by uh, age by dot residuals, geom point. And now this is part of the linear piece of the residuals that we shot out with each bit. I throw in a, um, I would say, a color equals tree. And now that we actually notice, now that we have the residual plots with, uh, with the H model, is it doesn't really look, it does look like there's some uh, effect. Notice at uh, this particular age, everything is below where the linear model would have predicted. So probably this, so linear fit is probably not appropriate for this data. And even if you had thousands of linear fits you were working with, you could do, um, you could do this kind of analysis in the mining process. If you want to work with plants, this is per model outputs. I could have said, take, um, take this data and map plants to it. And I have an R squared for each to say which, um, which models have the highest R squared, which models have the lowest R squared. Yeah. Any questions about some models and combining multiple models? Models sometimes will have different uh, models. Almost always have different coefficients. Uh, this that will allow uh, you to combine the same linear models and nonlinear least squares. They will have the same thing as the augmented method. They will both have dot and dot residuals. But open LN will define a lot of extra things like post standard error uh, that this up with um, that this won't uh, the uh, the the nonlinear least squares model would. That's okay when it comes to unnest. Because our nest will just fill in the, the obvious values with uh, an edge. If they're completely different kinds of models, and one has this kind of parameter and the other has this kind of parameters, it wouldn't be useful for them to come together anyway. Yeah. But one of the advantages of group is that whenever possible, uh, whenever possible, we use consistent column names across these methods. So you want to compare key values with group methods, it's always key dot value with the column name of a, of a key value. Uh, but for things like that, you also have to ask, like, when we compare really different kinds of models, there will get a point where they get out of sync enough that it's not just to compare or it will get extra sense. Uh, absolutely. But this brings you a lot closer than you might otherwise uh, be. Question. Any questions about my models? Let me show one other example. So I'm just going to use the model R package by a happy model R. Yeah, I think that was going to Yeah, so that's one of the uh, newest developments in this field. Uh, it's not, I don't think it's up on Kranian, it's still being developed on GitHub. Uh, and it's very exciting for a couple of tools that it provides to work with multiple models. So, I'll give an example. Let's go back to our long gas. Uh, so, here I've got a survival fit. Uh, and what did I say about that? Yeah, here we go. I did this whole, um, I did this whole step of visualizing a survival fit. I say, um, here's a server that does this, I can hide it, and today. Let's say I don't trust the assumptions behind these confidence intervals. I let's say I actually want to create a new one by bootstrapping. Who's familiar, are you familiar with bootstrapping? Yeah. Uh, you ever had, and raise your hand if you are familiar with bootstrapping. So I'm not bootstrapping, uh, Bootstrapping is when you take your original data, sample the growth of the original observations with replacement, then fit the model again. 
So we have to kind of gain a sense, uh, and you do that many times, to see how much your end estimates vary. So it's a way of, uh, it's a non geometric way of determining uncertainty, because by sampling from your original data, it's kind of similar to going back to original, uh, original um, that's like doing the experiment over and over. You're estimating how much things can change based on your particular reputation. Uh, there's a lot of theory behind it. Uh, and I learned in Afghan the R approach to bootstrapping, the boot package. So this is a new, but this is a newer method that is really uh, that uh, is in all of that is really exciting for that. So let's take the long data set. Right now, the long data set is a big data frame with what is it, 228 rows. If you load the model of that, library, model, R, and I do, uh, what I think is I take the long data set, and I do bootstrap 100 times. So I type this is bootstrap of long and 100 groups. Bootstrap long and 100 groups. What I get But I get is one row for each bootstrap in the sample. And I get two columns, one with the bootstrap data, it's called strap, and one with an ID that defines that. Each of these objects for right now, it's not um, it's not actually uh, it hasn't been evaluated yet, but it's a promise it's going to end up being um, Evaluated to, to end up being a uh, new data frame. So the so if I take, so when I uh, now I can treat every one of these as a resampled version of the data. So the first one, for example, say here's our straps. If I say straps, I want the first item out of it. We don't do. Let's take out a particular resampling. And uh, when I value it, I'm going to say, say as that, uh, it ends up doing that resampling for me. So it ends up actually saying, uh, so every one of these is going to be a bootstrap sample of our original data. And that's really powerful when we combine it with this modeling uh, mapping idea. Let's say we take this bootstrap data. And for every one of these samples, instead of looking at the subset as we did before, I'm going to map to every sample in the strap, every re uh, sample set of data, I'm going to map our model. And our model looks like this. For every resample data, I'm going to do replace this with uh, that says for each resample, I'm going to fit a survival uh, uh, a proportional proportional hazard model and do my entire thing on it. So now we have the original data, we've, uh, we've got an idea, we have each of these a bootstrap version of this model. So we're going to run a different bootstrap replicate. And now we can re unnest that. We take the uh, model and we highly each of them. This thing I didn't mention before is we can also just say, uh, if we have a stick in that slide step, where it's say we every model there, hide it. And then nested in the same stack. So we bootstrapped 100 samples. We model for every one of these uh, resamples. And then we unnest in the Kaiyu uh, version. So we get bootstrapped survivors. Looks like this. Now it's one large data frame where there's an ID column pulled out of it for each of these estimates. I have this original visualization here uh, for one survival method. But if you can plot one survival method, you can now plot a hundred bootstrap replicates and get a sense of the curve. Here's a bootstrap data. For time, um, time on the x-axis, the estimate on the y-axis, and group it by ID. And plot a line for each bootstrap replicate. Now, with these hundred samplings, we get a sense of our uncertainty. I like to throw to put this kind of uh, transparent 0.25, I'll make it 0.25 here. And I'll make it 0.2. So we get a hundred bootstrap samplings in the item table. 
of our curve. So this was done without any knowledge of how we were sliding the match. This is just done by performing a bootstrap on each of the sampling and then replot out and replotting. Okay, having the result, having the result together can see more power than that. If I want a bootstrap confidence interval, I can use the prior together. I can say within each time point, group by time, summarize, I want a low, so I want to have median is the median of our estimate. Low is the uh, is let's say point hit all the points that are at the time point and say point two at the uh, two point five percent out of one that gets This step, I'm actually getting from each time point the median of all the bootstraps and the low and high confidence interval based on the percentile number of our bootstrap outputs. So, we're going to do all this because we're working with multiple models in a tiny data set. This could be graphed similar to how we graphed earlier. We'll get that as an exercise for the video. Any questions about bootstrap? Now, that bootstrap is in model R. Model R, yeah. There's a bootstrap function in the broom package. It's, uh, I, it's going to be demoed to you in the next version because I like the variation in model R a lot more. I did work the one in the, in the broom package where it's a little different. Uh, but yeah, this is going to be a um, particularly powerful way of working with bootstrap outputs. Uh, questions about boots, uh, bootstrapping? What? So you, are you going to share this uh, code? Code? Yes. Yeah, I'm going to share Yes, that's what I'm going to share. Uh, I'll put this out along the slides. Uh, so a couple of examples that I showed on um, this slide. Kind of, kind of, kind of, um, it's very similar. I'm just um, entering here. We'll be, uh, can you take a combined data and say, I'm going to be squared as good. You can also show your uh, bootstrap method. One more step, I think this is one of the most interesting, is in simulation. If you want very long parameters in the uh, and let's say change it to a parameter instead of working with subsets of bootstrap. Here I'm going to show opinions plus two. I've paired two data files. I've paired some data files. Two dimensional, x1, x2. Who's done the opinions plus two before? Raise your hand if you're Raise your hand. Everyone raise their hand? Awesome. Yeah. All right. Here's plus three is a way of making our, our, our points and then dividing them into three groups of um, our Gaussian distributed uh, uh, clusters. So I take this data, I plot our three dimensions. How many clusters do we think this data has? Three. All right, you guys need to hear it? Yes, exactly. Um, I was going to count one, two, three. One, two, three, and I'm going to say, it's like, this is like, anyway, there's three clusters here. How do we, I mean, how many clusters require you to know that in advance? So you want to explore what K means would show if we try particular values of K. One K means cluster will look like this. I have turn the original data into a matrix, out of M. And I mean, K is K means of M, where K equals 3. Oops. Oh, it's centers. So if I say K, then here's what the object looks like. If I want to, and then I try to make two, two clusters, I get a different outcome. But it's hard for me to visualize what's the difference between each of these. So here's what I do. I would tie my own thing about doing this in a tidy way. I'll just start with one row for every value I want to test. Let's say I want k to be from 1 to 9. The number of clusters to be from 1 to 9. So I did a data underscore frame, create a data frame with 9 rows in it where k goes to 1 to 9. So I did that. Now I'm going to use pure, pure again 
on the uh, uh, on the side and say mutate where we say our model is going to be map to our k column k means of m dot. So this is saying is for every value of k from one to nine, I want to perform k means clustering, giving that as the number of centers. So it's going to create nine k means clusters. And there they are. Next to each K, now the K-means object. So far, not, not so far, what's really interesting is we take this and we unnest it out here to the We unnest let's say I have to save this for a moment. K plus. Here's our K plus object. Our ideation page for our object. So now we take the K plus. I unnest the tidy version of each model. That's what this looks like where I say, I take each model of tidy it, and then they nest. When k equals one, I get one center. When k equals two, I get two centers. When k equals three, I get three centers. And it's all combined for what that is. And it's only call centers. Well, that, that. I take the center's data and I can visualize it. I can say x1 versus x2, we can say the original data, color equals cluster. Eh, let's just say color. Genome point, but I need some difference between these nine variations. I just call facet graph them, that means giving each one of them a subplot. Now that I get my clusters for each of our nine clusters, I can see we have one cluster, two, three, four. It's a start of a block, but it's not much of one. Uh, make one change, we make a change the shape of it to axis and size it a bit bigger. These are my clusters. That's marks the spot. But centers are not the main point. The main point is what gets classified. So let's take a, uh, let's take another value where we say points. Which, uh, how do you have the grants? Which gets us the observations and predictions? Augment us, yeah. Augment takes your original data and adds predictions, residuals, parameters of that. So if I unnest the op, the map, mod, augment, Uh, and that could add up to the camera and get the original matrix solution. What I get now is a data set divided up by um, uh, where, where we have a tiny version that still exists there for each k. It's going to be tiny for k equals 1, tiny for k equals 2, tiny for k equals 3. And here's where it starts getting interesting because I can add that as late. I say, I also want genome point data equals centers and say color equals dot cluster. That's this part. So now what we see is a little bit bigger. Is your key means visualization for all nine values we're familiar with K-means clustering, but if you're not, you can kind of see where this uh, kind of cluster will come from. If you want to get everything in, when K equals 1 has to get everything into one cluster, center in the middle. K equals 2, you're going to combine the two clusters into one. K equals 3, that looks great. K equals 4, notice we're already splitting up the cluster. And if I to split up this cluster into 3, it's a 9, it's really just doing whatever it can, so it's really not a uh, visualization we want. Yeah, this will be this is what we can do in combining multiple models with different parameters. We can all be visualized with one command, all be compared in that one set because we're able to combine these levels. This is true even though we're looking at two different levels, one the tidy, one the augment, they can be combined and compared using tidy logic. The last one worth considering is the 
models of what we say in plus unnest and glance status. So say I want uh, for every one of them that's glance status. So what I'm here is a total within some squares parameter that's computed for each mean is plus one. Uh, can use one of its uh, parameters it tells you uh, the sum of squares within each of these clusters. And part of the point of clustering is to reduce that at as low as you can. And if you look at how what's the relationship of these, model, of these models between k, the number of clusters, and the total within some squares. Yep. You see an elbow. You see it goes when k equals one, a lot of the squares. K equals two, still a lot. Three. And then it, it, it goes down by much less. So increasing k will basically always decrease the total within some squares. But where does the uh, get diminishing returns on your return within some squares? So when you have many models combined, the last step is a great way to summarize the plot step uh, and start and, and compare them. So that's what you can do when you do the glass. We've got a high for our, our centers each cluster, points for all of our assignments, which add the combination of the tidy and uh, cluster data gets you this kind of visualization. And the glance gets you uh for uh, it gets you a way to last time with my mom. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, would there be You can also start nesting parameters. Um, Tidier has a crossing function similar to expand grid. When I, if I want to work with these nine values of k, but I also want to try, heck, let's try 10 different seeds. I could say crossing k equals 1 to 9, c equals 1 to 10, try 10 different seeds for every one, run a, uh, and run. For every single one of these, we do this. Uh, this uh, and an awesome uh, GKC to the one where you couldn't feed these in particular parameters. So it's really good for that kind of combination, absolutely. There's a lot more to the pur purer package than to the function map, and that one of these I like, pointed out is as good for this kind of logic. Is there an easy way to make this parallel? Uh, the best thing right now is a multi dpyr package. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, so it definitely, uh, but the other way, I can't think of fire package, uh, works well generally with, uh, if you want to do, so yeah, it's like, no, not this one, I'm just saying, no, I'm not, oh, okay, yeah. So, the only thing that it's helpful for a lot of this is logic, but for bootstrap action, here's a list, so you can use MCL apply instead of map, would get you the multi cores. I don't know if Pure is going to start supporting uh, parallelization. Parallelization is I don't do a ton of work with. I uh, don't do some, so it's um, anything that can apply to a model uh, would be able to do this. The model is definitely going to be an extensive step. So I can do the model with Pure tool. Yeah. And then, yes. Uh, okay, yeah. I so see anything that you can apply to a list and will run parallelly uh, okay. can work for that middle step. Yeah, I guess it's a pretty big data set. Absolutely, but yeah, it's a map step where you replace it with your, um, with your uh, parallelized like version of, uh, of list applying of choice. 
then that, that would be exactly the step to our decriminalization here. And in the end, it's, it, yeah, there's definitely a lot to be gained with decriminalization here just because the tying itself would be easy and a good way for people to buy on mm -hmm. Just to finish up, and then I'm on uh, questions afterwards. Uh, here I should have yeah, the full explanation of the um, this particular plot. There's a lot more about many models. I mentioned uh, it's an area that had really been interested in expanding recently. And his book, uh, R for Data Science, that is very writing with Derek Roman, Roman um, has a whole chapter on working with multiple models. The book, so this R4DS.ad, that code on it, you Google uh, R for Data Science, we'll probably get to it. And it does go over using the broom package for work with a large number of models. The chapter is still being written in my understanding, so not all is going to explore, but it really goes into how you compare multiple models here, so the gap minor data set, comparing multiple residuals, and uh, working with these list columns and guessing. Uh, so this is a much more expired uh, type version. Yeah, he's still writing the chapter on how you do that. Uh, on her. So the, um, the other things worth reading, uh, worth looking into, with the vignettes, I briefly mentioned this, we have one on key means. There's a manuscript up uh, on the archive now, if you're review at the art journal, uh, which, uh, where, which goes over, which goes to the theoretical ideas of the room and really explains them, along with some other case studies that I've discussed here. And if you've been wondering about your favorite model, it's not going to be my, my premiere if your model doesn't actually work how you want to, please do open an issue of both our uh, pull request on the um, on uh, on GitHub. Uh, so that we have a blog where we'll suggest to the model and um, where we create an education and we're working on getting as many models as we can into the package. So thank you to everyone who contributed uh as to the group package and paper and see Thank you. So it's questions. Can you paraphrase them so that it's loud enough for the Yes. So um, uh, what uh, what kind of methods do we do um, bring another kind of model into the collection that's maybe kind of like it? Well the um the, uh, so this is condensed it's a great question. The question is what is needed to add a model to the list of of uh, uh, models of three types? The first thing I think the hardest part is deciding what the tidy output should look like. And that often happens on a um, on a GitHub issue. I've developed a bit of a um, writing the majority of models that are currently in room, I developed some um, some uh, uh, intuition to uh, kind of internalize data and how some of these models should look. Uh, but I do have some of these conventions uh, for how a lot for these if you read these, it can be kind of wrong of what going here is what some coefficients should look like. Sometimes it's very straightforward. It's almost like a summary in the model, you say, oh, these are the parameters that we're going to turn by tiny. It has residuals that we're going to turn by um, by augment, and it will use this overall turn by class. In other cases, such as uh, mixed models, it takes a lot of thought on what it should return. Sometimes there are a few tiny models, you have to specify which. Uh, so in those cases, it's good to know if you and uh, you and me and some of the other people involved in package development can discuss that. But if someone here, uh, if you have a model that you can think, oh, I know exactly how this coefficient would look, I'd say um, pull requests do have a considerably higher and faster success than they are doing the issues. We have a lot of people requesting things and they keep on, um, and I sometimes fall behind on them. But, but pull requests, I can really do my best to, to take a look at uh, promptly and figure out how we can um, join that. So it usually would involve, uh, it usually involve Looking at a bunch of existing examples, realizing how um, tidy and how many flags work, and then um, and writing them up. Some of them are very simple. Uh, some of them might be one or two lines of code in the function. I still encourage them to be included since it's a way of, of always knowing how to work with the same code. Sometimes it'll take 50, 100 lines of code and a good amount of processing in, in, the, uh, in the middle. That's still okay. I, last night, a piece of advice I give is I encourage people not to do not to bring too many opinions outside of the model itself to it. So for example, not to compute things the package doesn't compute. So if it's a previous method saying, oh, here's the basic interpretation, I'll add a few more parameters for it, and a lot of stuff. So I really like to just take the information that the package has developed and turn it and change, just change the format of it. Good question. Yeah. Uh, 
But now all the testing is done is, is, is done in a different way. Does anybody know what the carrot? So the carrot package ran into this problem a while ago of, of, um, of having too many packages that it suggested such that it really just was dependent on too much. And they ended up splitting up their uh, testing framework from the actual from the package itself. Uh, and I've been sipping whether, whether it's worth getting to that point. Right now, it does take a while to go through on uh, suggest, for example, we're on tra um, when Travis does a check and it has to install all these packages. Oh. It, it has a way of, um, right now, it's a way of caching these packages that is a whole thing to show you from um, Jim Hester about that. I need to get to, uh, and, but that does make it more difficult. In truth, the test coverage of Groom is only something like 27%. It could be a lot better. But we do use, exa I do use examples uh, in the, um, for each function, so those would need to be. Split up. So if we do an example is um, if we do GLM net tidiers from Lasso, it looks like this, and we'll have some examples. And then we go to say if you have a GLM net package, then do all these steps and create. And this is creating a cause coefficients and how they go to zero. Uh, with increasing and, uh, and, and if I did, uh, yeah, uh, and look at the effects of uh, conversion and such, yeah. So that's, uh, so this is code that would, that does not. The other problem that I run into is dependencies where someone wants to change their package. Uh, but then I do get a decent number of things about the package will really break things, uh, which, uh, yeah, it makes it kind of in depth, I can really, Really grateful to all the people that contribute to Groom and notice these things and give uh, and will give pull requests of uh, contributing models or their expertise into those statistics. Um, so I always really really love it when people um, when other people uh, get involved in these kinds of issues and discussions. That's why it makes sense to export the Groom functionality to the package functionality. Yes, so exactly. So that's something why I why I was I want to um uh, I am, I'm hoping that other people can add Groom to their particular methods. So an example is Ben Boulder, uh, who, who uh, maintains LME4, uh, has been involved in a lot of Groom discussions on how, on how the tidy outputs of mixed effects models should look. And I know very little of mixed effect models, certainly compared to him, so I suggest that it's about right consideration moving tidy output and glance to the uh, LME4 package. And then you can still import the tidy output and glance as three methods from Groom. I really is kind of getting asked what I need to create a um, vignette and guide to writing from the tires. Uh, I just keep that in mind how uh, that is. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Can I have one more? So it seems like um, some of the, you know, the, some of the um, problems for the tidy output might, might have caused out one set of models and not so well the other models. I have in, in my particular branch for us, which is Aren't really explicable in terms of the kind of parameters that we're okay for you know, models or things like that. So you know, it seems like there would be a you, you could you know devise some set of columns that are, that are applicable, but it's not really the same as the others. And do you just have to look at that as a user, or is there any way to reconcile that? Well, the tidy output, so the question is what if our part, what if a model like our part whose tight version has no real relationship to a linear model or another kind of regression model? So the answer to say is that that's true at the component level, but then in practice, you wouldn't want to compare those two anyway. You wouldn't put on the same plot uh, that uh, the structure of a linear, of a linear model versus our plot. But what you might compare is the uh, predictive, is the predictive values, the categories. And that, uh, when they will have a similar augment outcome. And then I was saying, so if you have to say, I predicted this with the logistic model out of GLM, uh, GLM. I predicted this one with these categories kind of with that. I these this classification, I used a random forest. So the structure of the model is very different. And as a result, the tidy up component level summary will be different, can't really be combined. But in both cases, you're going to have predictions on each of your, um, on each of your original values, and that can, that can be 
combine and compare to say where the areas of, uh, of uh, difference, or if I bootstrap all these of one, bootstrap all these of the other, anything you can combine and compare with uh, the point and model you put. Uh, similarly, if it has the uh, AIC or BIC, however, so they would call it wood, and those can be combined and uh, compared across the linear, and uh, those are the glance outputs, and they can be compared across the linear models. And say and uh, random cars models. So even though the random cars model may not have an R squared or an adjusted R squared, it will have an AIC or DIC disability model, and those can be uh, those can be combined. Just the answer they find in most cases, if you can combine two models, uh, two tidy version of, of models, they weren't really meant to be combined. They aren't to be combined on the, on the same spectrum, and in the cases of augmented glance. Any other questions? Yeah. Cool. Oh, also, one last thing is this. Does anyone do you here use hex stickers? Yeah. Just it does. Yeah. So I have a pile of uh, green hex stickers. If anyone wanted to decorate your laptop or anything like that, our studio just printed these up for me uh, a month or so ago. Uh, so if you want one, uh, go ahead and grab these all the back there. Thanks, David. Uh, thanks, David. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you.